very angry with the international response, um, viewing Israel as an aggressor, um, and also with, with subsequent responses like the Helen Thomas case of, of bigoted and just simply historically inaccurate uh, comments and the, the Turkish president's comment, insensitive comments about a, a final solution to Mideast peace. Uh, my question for the panelists is, what is the general consensus, or is there a general consensus, in the academic circles in the United States? Stephen Cook. I don't think uh, that there is a consensus. I think that there are widely uh, diverse views about what happened. As as Jim pointed out and Omer pointed out in answering the previous caller, there is – there are certain narratives that are becoming truths to certain people in this in this incident. Uh, the Israelis uh, certainly perceive the international community as being biased against them. After all, Hamas is a terrorist organization. It is responsible for uh, quite a bit of Israeli blood. Uh, the problem, as always in this conflict, is that that is a reasonable position. But there is another reasonable position. That is, Gaza is an open-air prison. Uh, despite the fact that the Israelis withdrew in 2005, Gazans uh, have been under closure for the course of the last three years. In fact, you have Israeli leaders like Ehud Barak, who once said if he was a Palestinian, he'd probably be a member of Hamas himself. So there are two narratives here. The problem is both of them make a certain amount of sense to a lot of people. And here's an email on that very subject uh, from Emerald, who says the one thing none of these has experts mention is that Hamas does not want peace. They call for the destruction of Israel. Is that what Turkey supports? Turkey is becoming another Islamic state, but are pretending they are not. Omer. Well, what Turkey supports is definitely uh, a change in Hamas's attitude, and Turkey believes that Hamas should be offered a chance to actually show that it is serious. But has Hamas not been offered a chance in the past? When they won the elections, they thought that they would be able to uh, uh, give a chance by the international community. Instead, what happened, despite the fact that the U.S. was supportive of Hamas entering the elections, the U.S. was totally surprised when Hamas won. And all of a sudden, there was an embargo against Hamas. And Turkey wanted to reach out to Khalid Meshal, actually, the leader of Hamas, and to say, look, you have an opportunity here to change your position. You know, radical terrorist organizations in time change their positions. If they can move to the center, especially when they have responsibilities, when they assume power. So the frustration of the prime minister Erdogan is that Hamas, after winning elections, was not really given a chance to really run the country. James Kitfield, you're shaking your head. Well, I mean, the, um, all that's true. However, I mean, they've been given many chances to, re to renounce this platform of Israel's destruction, to basically agree on past agreements that would allow the peace process to continue, and they have refused. So they are a very prickly problem. I, I take the point. I mean, Fatah itself, the, the moderate side of this equation that we're trying to support was itself – a terrorist organization under Yasser Arafat at, at some points, and they came in from out of the cold too. This this is the evolution, and, and we everyone would like to see that happen with Hamas. At some point, though, Hamas is going to have to renounce this platform of calling for Israel's destruction. Steve, I just want to say I don't believe in the pothole theory of the moderation of Islamist movements. Uh, Fatah came in from the cold long before it gained responsibility for the Gaza Strip. Uh, there's no evidence to suggest that, for example, Hezbollah, which has been part of the Lebanese government or at least the Lebanese parliament since the early 1990s has moderated as a result of that political participation. Uh, there's no evidence to suggest that uh, Hamas has, uh, has moderated as a result of controlling the Gaza Strip since uh, 2007. Uh, these organizations base their legitimacy on the idea of resistance. If they were no longer resistance organizations, they wouldn't be different from anybody else. Stephen Cook of the Council on Foreign Relations you're listening to The Diane Rehm Show. And let's go finally to Chesterfield, Missouri. Good morning, Paul. 
Uh, good morning, Diane. Thanks. Just a brief comment and then a quick question for your panelists. Sure. Uh, the topic of uh, hypocrisy has come up, you know, with regard to Turkey's position, for example, with uh, regard to their attitude and treatment toward the Kurds. And one of your guests mentioned uh, an apology should be forthcoming. You know, if you mentioned apology to the Turks over the Armenian genocide in 1915, uh, let's see what kind of reaction you'd get from, from the Turks. It would, it would not be favorable. The question has to do with the Turkish military, which I think is the ace in the hole here. Um, will they remain supportive of this government? Go ahead, Stephen. Um, I'm going to skip over the question of uh, the Armenian genocide. I'll leave that to either Jim or Omer. I don't feel qualified. I think we'll leave it out of this morning's but discussion. The, the question of the of the military establishment is a very, very interesting one. For quite some time, we have perceived the Turkish military as being the most powerful, secular-oriented institution in uh, in Turkish history. It had four times has undertaken coups to get rid of governments that it didn't like. However, over the course of at least the last six months, but in a long process that began after the Justice and Development Party came to power in 2002, uh, there has been an effort to bring the Turkish military under civilian control. It's not really a question that the military supports the Justice and Development. Uh, it just does not have the wherewithal in terms of public opinion behind it or the resources to undermine this government. It has tried, and at each moment that it has tried to undermine this government, the government has won. Oh, Mayor. I think the days of a military coup in Turkey are over. Uh, the Turkish military no longer feels that it has a mandate to do, to do so. This government in Turkey is very popular uh, in the eyes of the majority of Turkish pop, uh, public opinion. And do you think that the majority of public opinion within Turkey is in favor of this flotilla that was sent there uh, to Israel and to Gaza. They are now. The irony is that no one knew about this issue uh, that much, but now it's in the agenda, and there is a sense of outrage and fury, and people sympathize with uh, the prime minister now, with AK Party, and there is a sense of nationalist solidarity behind the government. So in that sense, one thing that Israel has achieved is to really rally more support against this government in Turkey, uh, in, in, in that sense, I think that th this is a, a paradox of the situation. What do you expect to happen next, James Kitfield? I actually think something something good could come of this. I think we'll re re relook the Gaza, the Gaza blockade. It, there'll be some relaxation of that. Um, and I suspect that uh, uh, unless... How much relaxation and then perhaps temporary and then... Resume. Well, until until you you get to this this it's thorny problem of Hamas, um, you're not going to solve the Gaza problem, but you can you can certainly mitigate its its effects on the majority of Gazans by allowing, like like Steve said, everything in that's not barred, i.e., weapons, um, and and giving them a life basically. And I think that that's where this is probably headed. James Kitfield of National Journal, Steve Cook, he's senior fellow for Middle Eastern Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations, Omer Teshpinar of the U.S. National War College and director of the Turkey Project at the Brookings Institution. Thank you all so much. Pleasure. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. And thanks for listening all. I'm Diane Rehm. The Diane Rehm Show is produced by Sandra Pinkard, Nancy Robertson, Jonathan Smith, Susan Neighbors, Denise Couture, and Monique Nazareth. The engineer is Toby Schreiner. Dory Annisman answers the phones. Visit drshow.org for audio archives and CD sales, transcripts from Softscribe and podcasts. Call 202-885-1200 for more information.